We were in Green Bay, and we asked the boys where they wanted to eat. It's always a dangerous question. And they said, where we can throw the peanuts on the floor. And I'm like, yeah, we'll go to Texas Roadhouse. This all started a couple of years ago. We were at a Texas Roadhouse, and there were two buckets on the table, one full of peanuts, one bucket underneath that bucket. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with the peanut shell? And I saw other people just chucking them on the floor, so I did the same. And at that point in time, my lovely wife said, why do you think they give you a second bucket on the table? I don't know. I was taught never assume, baby. And so, <laughs> and so the, the boys, they just, they just started that. So if you've ever worked at a Texas Roadhouse or if, if you are currently a server at a Texas Roadhouse, apologies from the Persley family. If you see us coming, you're going to want us moved to another section because it's going to be a disaster after we've eaten at your table. But we were not the only people in Green Bay who wanted to eat at Texas Roadhouse that night. And we pulled into the parking lot, and it's one of those you couldn't even park near the restaurant. We had to park over by the shopping complex and then walk quite a ways. And we're like, you, you guys sure you want to you sure you do this? They're like, yeah, we want to do this. And as soon as you open the door, you just see it is elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder. People can't move. There are so many people inside of that place. And we're like, you guys really want to do this? And they're like, yeah. All right, let me go see how long it's going to be. And so we put the name in, and they always undersell you. They're like, ah, yeah, 15, 20 minutes. You're thinking, yeah, add an hour. And maybe, (laughs) maybe we're close, but all right, we'll do it. Thinking maybe the hunger would set in, and then the boys would decide they wanted to go somewhere. It's just easier to do it that way sometimes than just to play the I'm your dad card, suck it up, we're going somewhere else. So we're just like, we'll just let the hunger set in, and, and then they'll, they'll want to go somewhere else. So we, we waited outside for a couple minutes. But again, this was a few weeks ago, and we're north of Toronto here. And so it was freezing. And we're like, yeah, this isn't going to work. Let's go back inside and be uncomfortable with how many people are, are in there. And so that's exactly what we did. And there was really nowhere to stand. And then we saw the hostess take a party to their table. And so we scooted right in there. And we were right by where they make those rolls. And if you've never been to Texas Roadhouse, their rolls are a taste of heaven. And so we watched the process, and it looks unremarkable, but there is some kind of pixie dust that they sprinkle on these things. <laughs> and then there's a cinnamon butter that you just slather those hot rolls in, and it's, oh, it's great. But, but there's so many people, we're literally like looking at the poor gentleman who's making the rolls as if he were an animal in a zoo. Like There's just nowhere else to go and nowhere else to look. And so we're just staring him down, making him completely uncomfortable as he makes rolls like it's not that fascinating of a process but we just don't really have anywhere else to go or anything else to do so we're like watch the man make the rolls and then they were bringing around some appetizers and then a manager looked over and he saw dean dean and ethan and he saw their eyes just transfixed on the roll process and then we became the envy of everyone in the texas roadhouse when the manager brought us hot fresh baked rolls complete with cinnamon butter and he brought us our own order and everybody else was getting like a little taste of their onion blossom one petal and there we were with a basket of rolls and you could just see everybody's mouth salivating you could see the daggers that they're shooting out of their eyes and poor Brooke you know she's a sweet person she's like maybe we should offer to share and I'm like no we will not offer to share no one offered to share their seat with us we're fine thank you very much I will eat all the rolls if that's how you're gonna think so we didn't share and we ate all the rolls and the rolls got us through what was otherwise just a very very uncomfortable situation just because there were so many people you couldn't move I know some people have a lifelong goal of going to Times Square on New Year's Eve and standing in one spot for 20 hours and wearing adult diapers so that they don't lose their spot in the middle of the street in December slash January in New York City. And if that is a lifelong goal of yours, I'm not here to discourage you. I'm just here to say aim higher because I do not understand at all. 
I do not understand at all that thought process. Let's go be shoulder to shoulder and let's be miserable. I, I don't mind big crowds, but I'm not somebody, I like my personal space. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of the general admission concerts where there's no seats um, and everybody feels like if they're a half inch closer to the artist that the artist is magically going to become their best friend. I like my space. I like a little, you know, just a couple inches that I can that I can move and I can get my groove on if the music's calling my name and that is a sight to behold. But I just, I like, I like some space. And this morning, we're going to see, as we we continue what we're calling walking on water, we're going to see Jesus perform another miracle. And for those of you who who missed last week, today we're not talking about Jesus walking on water, but we're just looking at some of the miraculous things that Jesus, Jesus does and how that intersects with the lives of ordinary people and what what that means and the implications of that. So the series is called Walking on Water, but we're not looking every week at Jesus walking on water from a different account. So just wanted to clarify that. So today we're going to look at a miracle that Jesus did in Mark chapter 2. And you can follow along in your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets or on the screens where we read this. And when he returned, that's Jesus, and when Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. So Jesus, he starts to declare the truth about himself. He starts to proclaim things. He starts to do some miraculous things. And people are talking. And the word gets out. And then Jesus goes to Capernaum. He's chilling at a house. And people start coming. And come and keep coming and keep coming. And more and more people keep arriving on the scene. So that everywhere you go in that house, people are shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow. They keep asking people to scoot up. Scoot up and scoot in. Scoot up, scoot in. Let's make sure we can get as many people here. And there are so many people in that place that you can't even see in the door. There are people literally who can't even get in the house. But they want a glimpse of what Jesus is all about. They want to see and they want to hear what is happening and what's going on. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. And so Jesus is in this house. There are so many people gathered. You can't even get in the house. And here come four guys, carrying a fifth. Carrying a paralyzed man because they've heard about Jesus. And they know that if there's an encounter with Jesus, this is the chance for something amazing to happen. This is the chance that this guy has. And so they're willing to carry him to see Jesus. A couple months ago, we took our boys to their first NHL game, they're, they're in love with hockey. I don't, I don't know how. I, I was never a hockey fan growing up, and I, I had a really great dad, and he never really pushed anything on me, and so I, I wanted to model that to my kids as well and didn't really try to push many things on them, although being a fan of the Cincinnati Reds in our house is a non-negotiable, and one of our kids is on the verge of getting kicked out right now. Uh, <laughs> but So pray for him. He's going to have a long way to go. But they've, they've developed a love for hockey, and so we took them over to, to St. Paul to see the, the Minnesota Wild, and it was just a fantastic experience. Just their guest services team over there at the Excel Center was top-notch, but we took our kids on, on a trip, and as you find out when you're a father, vacations are absolutely miserable because you spend a lot of money, and then there's not a lot of sleep, and your kids just whine and complain the whole time, and then later tell you it was one of the best times they've ever had in their life, and you're like, great, that's, that's awesome. Glad you enjoyed it because you made it miserable for me. And, and the game started at, at 7, so it wasn't over till about 9.30 or 9.45, and we were seated in the upper deck, and so Dean was almost asleep a couple times in the game. He's, he's four. And I looked at my wife, and he was asleep on her. I said, well, there's no sense of waking him. You want to carry him to the car? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, all right. And so I... I 
shuffled, and I picked him up, and I carried him up the steps of, of the arena. And we waited for the elevator. And then one of the customer service people came over and said, it's going to be much faster if you take the stairs. That's fun. Thanks. And so we walked down what felt like 86 flights of stairs. It was really six. And then I had found cheap parking online and paid in advance because it was only three quarters of a mile away. I'm like, there, that's good. Oh, I should have paid the extra 10 bucks. I get outside, and as soon as that wind hit my four-year-old, he got a sudden burst of energy. And where I had his head on my shoulder and I had my arms behind his butt and I was carrying him along, when that wind hit, all of a sudden he thought it would be fun to lean backwards at certain times during the walk. And so I'm having to bring him back in. And of course, we, we exited the building on the opposite side that we needed to. So we circled the arena. And then when we started our process to the three-quarter mile journey to our car, I look and my four-year-old's going like this. And I said, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm flapping my flippers, Dad. I'm like, what? He's like, it's, it's going to make us go faster because you're taking a really long time. <laughs> are you serious right now? I put him down. He starts crying. I'm like, what's wrong? I don't want to walk. I'm like, then don't stop talking about how long it's taken. We get up. That was the longest, the longest three-quarter mile walk in my life. The wind was unforgiving. My four-year-old would just start leaning back at different times and then laugh in my face because he thought it was hilarious. And then when I'd put him down, he'd cry and shoot his mother this look. And again, she's a very sympathetic person. She's like, are you really going to make him walk? And I'm like, yes. And then she'd shoot me the look. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then I'd pick him up out of guilt, not because I wanted to, that kid weighs less than 40 pounds. Imagine you're carrying a paralyzed man. You and three other people. Because there's hope. And the arms, they burn. And your back, it starts to hurt. And every step feels like a mile after a while. And I don't know if at some point they had to put him down just to rest their arms, just to take a minute, get a drink. I don't know if they were just so overcome with adrenaline that there is Jesus and there is hope that they were just able to make it in one fell swoop. But what I do know is they were feeling it the next day. There's no question about that. And they're carrying a paralyzed man to go see Jesus. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, They removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Oh, imagine the journey, the burning sensation where the arms are on fire and then they go numb just because you've been carrying him for so long. And then you get there and your heart sinks because the venue is sold out and they are lined up outside. There's no way you are getting close to Jesus. All of this was for naught. All of this journey was for nothing. Oh, but they let their disappointment turn into determination and they would not be denied and they saw the crowd and they saw that there was no chance that they had at getting to Jesus and they said we're finding a way and they carried him up a ladder they carried him up a ladder onto a flat roof and they just started busting at somebody's house can you imagine being the insurance agent when you get that claim they carried him to the roof and they bust a hole in the roof and they lower the man down because they knew there was hope and nothing would stand in their way. They didn't live in their disappointment. They channeled it to become determination. 
And I wonder, have some of us just chosen to reside in a place of disappointment? Have we gotten the bad news a little too often? Have we counted every step of the journey and then seen the crowd? And just chosen to give up? Just chosen to quit? Just said the odds are too much? I can't. I want to challenge you. Use the disappointment that you experience and allow it to fuel within you a determination. And that doesn't mean that if you are on one path and you keep experiencing failure and there's disappointment there that you're necessarily called to go on that same path. In fact, that disappointment may be divine and it may be from God telling us that we need to go in a different direction. But don't allow your disappointment to lead to defeat. Choose instead to allow it to fuel your determination. And when Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And so here's my question Who surrounds you? Who surrounds you? Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? There's the question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And the answer is no one. No one has the power to do what Jesus just proclaimed to this man to be done. No one has that power except for God. And in this instant, Jesus uses this to reveal his divinity. He reveals that he is in fact God. Because no one has the power to do what Jesus has just declared done. And immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Well, this just got real awkward. So we have all these people who are here to hear Jesus and see Jesus. And then debris starts falling on people. Like the roof is caving in, literally And you look up and all of a sudden you see tools and hands coming through the roof. And you're like, we're under attack. And then you see the hole just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then is lowered a paralyzed man. And then Jesus looks at them and says, your sins are forgiven. And then you start to say amongst yourselves and within your own heart, well, who is that power? Who can do that? Who can do that? The old, you're you're trying to be quiet about what you're saying about somebody. You don't necessarily want them to hear. It's it's the inner monologue, the inner thought process that you have. That once you get to a certain age and your hearing starts to go, you think you're being quiet, but you're not. And then everybody hears it. And then you go a couple more years after that. And then the filter's just completely gone. And you know everybody can hear and you just don't care. But they're not there yet. They're not there yet. And so Jesus knows that this is going on within themselves. And he just encounters it. And he just addresses it right at the core. And Jesus asks a question that pierces them to their core. This is what he asks. Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. 
but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. So Jesus asked them this question, this rhetorical question. Which is easier? Which is easier to say to somebody, your sins are forgiven, or rise, get up and walk? Well, neither. I can't heal people. Have you ever wondered why when they, when, they, when they make this hole and they lower the paralytic down, Jesus didn't just say, stand up and walk. Because Jesus deals with the greatest need first. And the greatest need is universal. And it's a need that we all possess. It is a need for redemption. You may have a lot of things going on in your life. You may have a lot of problems. The greatest problem you have in your life is not your finances. The greatest problem that you have in your life is not your marriage. The greatest problem that you have in your life is not your kids. The greatest problem that you have in your life is not your work. The greatest problem you have in your life is you are at your core separated from your creator. But no, you're not alone. And that is a universal problem that impacts every single one of us. But that is our greatest need. Our greatest need is redemption. And they lower the paralyzed man before Jesus, and he deals with the greatest need first. And that is this problem that we've all made choices. We've all made the decision to rebel against God in certain areas of our lives. And we are separated from our Creator as a result. And that is what must be dealt with before anything else. This is the greatest need, and it is universal that we all have made those mistakes. We all have made choices to rebel. We have all sinned and fallen short of the standard of God. This is universal. This is the paralyzed man's greatest need. This is our greatest need. And Jesus dealt with the greatest need. He said, your sins are are forgiven. And how could Jesus forgive sins? Because Jesus would pay the price for our sin. Because the cost of our sin, the cost of our mistakes, is death. And in just a couple years, from saying these words, was an act we will remember this Friday. When Jesus laid down his life for my greatest need and your greatest need. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus continued, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And Jesus now heals the man of his physical need, demonstrating his power. He alone is God. He alone is able to forgive sins. He deals with the greatest need in the realm that is unseen, and then he deals with the other needs in the realm, this realm that is seen, and the people see it, 
and they are amazed. That's the power of God. Have you dealt with your greatest need? The need for redemption. We elevate so many other things. We elevate so many other problems. We elevate so many other situations in our lives. And yet, the core we must remain focused on, and we must first address whether or not we have dealt with that need through a relationship with Jesus. And another question. Is who's carrying you? Who's carrying you? When the weight of this world knocks you down, when it beats you up, when the voices tell you you're not enough, you're not good enough, when the critics celebrate because they think they were right, and they've seen you fail, and they get a sick satisfaction out of that, when the cynics sneer, when you are defeated and you are down and you just can't carry yourself, when you can't get there, who in your life is carrying you? Who do you have around you that says you can't get there maybe right now by yourself? But no matter what it takes, I'm grabbing this sheet. And I don't care how many miles I have to walk. I don't care how bad my arms burn. I don't care if I can't feel my back. I am carrying you. I'm not letting you go through it alone. Who is carrying you? Because so often we believe the lie that we have to do it by ourselves. And we think, I can't let other people in. I can't let people see me when I'm vulnerable. I can't let people know what I'm really thinking. I can't let people see my faults. I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll get there. And we collapse. And we can't go any further. And we all need people who are willing to bend down. Grab hold. And when the signs show up, and it seems like it's just another dead end, they look at us. They look at one another. And they say, screw it, there's a ladder, let's go. We're getting you to where you need to be. You need friends. You need people in your life that you can count on. And the best way to discover who your friends are is when things aren't going well. Because they'll still be around. And they'll be there to be counted on. Who's carrying you? And my last question is, who are you carrying? Who are you willing to say, no matter what it takes, no matter what it costs, no matter the inconvenience, I am willing. I will help you. I will point you to Jesus. I will walk with you through the storm. My phone will be on for you at 3 o'clock in the morning. Whatever you need. I'm here. that's community and that is what we're called to God I pray that we would be people who refuse to allow disappointment to turn into defeat 
but instead use it as a fuel for determination. God, I pray that we would deal with our greatest need. And that is our relationship with you. And I pray if there's anyone in this room, God, who has not made the decision to follow you, that they would just see, God, they would see the gravity and they would truly sense that it is their greatest need. And they would choose to place their trust in you. Through accepting what your son Jesus has done on our behalf, paying the price for our sins, and making it so that we could have a relationship with you. God, I pray that we would be people who are friendly to all, and yet we would be people who have friends. People who would carry us when we need it. Who would be invested in our lives. And I pray that we would be invested in their lives and we would be willing to carry people when they need it. Help us be that community. Work in us. We ask in your son Jesus' name.